Hello, hello, you guys. It's It's been about a week, maybe even two since I've been on. I had a bit of a vacation, and uh, my vacation ended up not being uh, much of a vacation because the people I went to visit uh, ended up in a victim mentality. And it just so happens I'm working on a book right now called Victim to Valiant and uh, trying to help people understand that victim mentality is a, a perspective that we can shift for ourselves and take our power back in those moments where we feel weak, where we feel victimized by others. And I just wanted to bring this topic up, talk to you guys a little bit about situations where you might have felt victimized. Talk about situations where you felt powerless um, based on the circumstances or even the reactions that other people had, where you lost your power. You know, where you were overcome by the emotion of that moment or overcome by the, the hard situation and how hard it can be really to pull yourself out of that mentality. Um, so my book, the Victim to Valiant book that I'm working on, really breaks it down into like steps, right? Um, and we, we tend to think that being a victim, you know, that, that we're not at fault. And that is true. In a situation where someone has made a poor choice and you are the person on the other end getting kind of smashed with this poor choice and the consequences of their poor choice, it can be very easy to fall into this victim mentality that they're the bad guy, that they are the one that, that is in the wrong. The truth is, is when you're faced with a situation where you could very easily be victimized, you have a lot of tools that a lot of people aren't taught. There are a lot of tools available to get you out of that headspace, to get you out of that heart space, and to give you your power back. Now, I don't know if anyone listening here has a situation they'd like to share where they felt victimized, where they felt powerless. And maybe would like to see a different perspective on how to how to maybe not react the way they did or how to change the outcome of a, a difficult situation. Um, but I'll just give my situation over the weekend um, so you guys can see how I shifted that power dynamic because really victimization only happens when you give your power away. There is a power struggle between you and the other person, between you and the situation itself. So I went uh, to visit my family in California. I went to see my friend. I was meant to stay at her house all weekend. Um, she had a birthday. It was a great birthday. We had a great time. But she made a, a, uh, a poor choice and uh, ended up ditching me, her guest, to go, to go um, you know, get comfortable with a guy in a bathroom. <laughs> and I was like, excuse me, um, where did my friend go? And I felt disrespected in that moment. And I didn't really like the situation anymore. I was like, you know what? I'm not comfortable with the situation. And I was very upset, but I didn't make that anybody's problem. I quietly tried to, uh, you know, just go through the emotions, process the emotions. And then I said the boundary, which is I'm not comfortable with the way my friend is treating me. So I called up my, my other friend in town and I asked her if she could come and pick me up because I was, I was not really comfortable with that situation. Now, we could just say that that situation ended, right? It'd be so, so easy for that situation to have been over and for me to have been able to walk away and for her and I to talk later. But she put herself in a victim mentality and said that I had done something to her, that by me leaving the situation, that I had made her, you know, that I had hurt her. I understand that perspective. I really do. And I empathize. But for me, having been a victim in other situations, I decided to take my power back, set my foot down, say, I don't deserve to be treated this way. And I left. Um, and I continued to be compassionate. I didn't 
accuse her of anything and I understand her situation and I'm you know I'm cool with it like she can do what she wants but for me it was the level of disrespect and I refuse to to um, allow people to treat me that way so that's how I have come to this place in my own life of refusing to be the victim in situations is I want to put my foot down I told her my boundary I told her what she did wrong um, and how it affected me and I don't expect her to necessarily do anything she doesn't have to make it up to me but I would like to hear her receive you know to, to like articulate back to me that she understood what she did and how it affected me so that I know that I can trust this person again and I think that when we go into relationships or we go into friendships with people, that that is a really good way to set healthy boundaries with the people we're interacting with, whether it be a coworker, a family member, or a friend, um, letting them know when they crossed your boundary and in a factual way, like, hey, these were the events that happened and this is how these events made me feel. And I decided to take this action. Now, just because somebody hurts you doesn't mean you go slash their tires or you go, you know, <laughs> go break some windows. No, 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 no. Um, when, when we set boundaries, it is letting people know that, oh, you disrespected me. I'm not going to let you do that again. And you can walk away. Some people really struggle with being okay with you walking away because they're not used to people setting boundaries. So in this situation how did i handle this person who did not uh who did not like my boundary well i stopped responding i stopped reacting i told them that i cared about them and that i will be ready to talk when they are ready to talk and right now they're not ready to talk even though they think they are i'm not ready to talk because the way they're reacting so there are a lot of different scenarios, a lot of different situations where one can become victimized, where one can be put in a situation where you're not safe, you're not feeling respected, you're not feeling like like you're in an environment that that is uh, conducive to your your health, your well being. And pardon me, my air conditioner just turned on, and I happen to be sitting right beside it. Give me just a moment. <laughs> so bring myself back to the the uh, train of thought here that I had things can be as easy as saying no and making sure that other people understand your boundary and holding that boundary just because my friend had every excuse in the book why she believed that that was appropriate behavior and why I should forgive her right away. I know what my boundary is. I know how I expect people to treat me. And I know my own self-worth. A lot of people don't. And if you're in a stage where you are still trying to figure out what your self-worth is, how you expect people to treat you, you know, you can learn those things as you go and as you are in situations where you feel victimized. But the best thing to do is to make sure that you are putting yourself in a situation where you are empowered so that your energy and your attention and your focus isn't going into these people. And you can't take it personally. A lot of people that hurt people are hurt people, right? They have problems. I know my friend has, has pain. And that that's how she is choosing to deal with her pain. And I can't change her actions and I would never expect to. But I'm not going to be a casualty of someone else's poor choices. And that's how I chose in this particular situation to not be victimized and to step away and be a warrior for myself, to be a warrior for my own self-respect. And that's just a little bit of kind of how how this book goes it takes the, certain situations certain scenarios and it teaches tools on how to change your perspective change your approach to being victimized 
Um, like I said, it can be applied to anything. And I, I definitely cover like real abuse because it's really difficult in an abusive situation to not feel victimized. But I do go into deep depth about that. And I would like to invite anybody here in the room who'd like to chime in to join the conversation. Um, you know, this, this came up today because I was able to take a moment. And I just wanted to share that I'm working on this project, that these are, these are some issues I think that maybe we're not talking about enough. We're not talking about how many people are, you know, are, are in this victim mentality. We're all in this fight and flight mode. So many people are being offended by words. And they're taking things too personally. We can't control other people. And we need to return back to a place in society where we can be comfortable with people feeling free to speak their minds, feeling free to express themselves without every single thing being offensive to us individually. Now, there are appropriate things to say, obviously, and things that are not appropriate to say. But I, I'm noticing that how we as a society, how um, maybe media is kind of encouraging us to handle these situations is not really in a healthy way anymore and you know is there much we can do about that of course there is on a personal level we can start to change how we how we handle these situations but on a on a global level we're going to have to work as a team the more people who refuse to be victimized who refuse to be turned into a scapegoat or refuse to use excuses to explain away their situations or other people's situations. That's how we re-empower ourselves. So if anyone would like to join in, share a time when you felt victimized, share a time when you felt like you really got like disrespected. And it's like, how did I, you know, how would I handle that situation? Or maybe you believe you handled a situation in a really mature way where you were able to take your power back from that situation i'd love to hear your stories i'd love to hear um maybe something you're going through right now that you'd like to maybe find a solution for where there's no confrontation where you are able to feel free from the burden of that situation um so i'm opening the floor if anybody wants it i know we got 10 people here that's not too many people but you're welcome to to hop on and join the conversation. So anyway, um, yeah, I've just noticed that that victimization has become almost a societal norm. And I would really like to encourage people to change that perspective because not only does it encourage other people to continue with that behavior of hurting people and then just, oh, it's okay. I'm the bad guy, right? I mean, that's how Billie Eilish got through her, her moment where she felt like she was, where somebody tried to play the victim and she, she, you know, she took her power back by saying, okay, fine. I'm the bad guy. Right. I thought that was a, a really, really interesting song that she wrote um a different take on the this victim mentality and how to shift it as she she decided not to take it personally fine i'm the bad guy right <laughs> um if you don't know the song you're welcome to check it out i don't i don't have it but it's a it's a good song um it's just it's become so so uh you know popular and you know just to be the victim like we all want to hear each other's stories yes we all want to be there to support people who've been hurt yes but do we need to live in that trauma do we need to carry that trauma with us for years and years and years do we need to allow that trauma to be an excuse for why we can't thrive in our lives absolutely not there are ways to evolve through these experiences you can even go back and do some work on like how you could have handled that situation better 
what you could possibly do if you're ever put in a situation like that again. And for those of you who weren't here, I did go into my own personal situation that just recently happened and how I, I felt I handled it um, by taking my power back when I could have very easily played the victim. I could have very easily gotten away with the sympathy card. I could have been the, you know, played the pity, pity card and be like, oh, pity me, apologize to me because this, you know, I was hurt and you were the bad guy. And, but I don't, I don't want that. I don't want that for myself. I don't, I don't want to bring myself to that level. So I do have a guest um, in the waiting room. I'd like to invite Cicely to join us. Come on in, Cicely. I can't wait to hear what you have to say. Thank you so much to, to join and tune in today. Thank you. No problem. I don't really have much to say, but I am listening in at your topic because I'm one of those people that I think is just a little bit too sensitive and I fall into the victim mentality far too easily. So I'm listening in. Well, I really appreciate that. And it, it does take a lot of self-awareness to, to recognize that. So, I mean, I, I have to commend you because it really, it really does take a level of, a level of strength to recognize that in yourself and say, you know what, I don't want to live like this anymore. Yeah. So what's going on? Do you want to, you, you don't have to share if you don't want to, but you're welcome to. It's a free space. I encourage everyone to hold space for you. Man, I just came up to say I like the topic and I'm going to keep listening in. I hope somebody else will chime in with a good story. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much, Cicely. I really appreciate you letting me know that you're here, that you are that you resonate with what I'm talking about. It's good to know that there's not just, you know, like a blank room here. I, I really do appreciate that. No problem. I just wanted to let you know I was here. And I'm listening in, and I really want you to keep going because it's open. Awesome. I will. So, um, yeah. You're welcome to, uh, you know, come on back in if you want to. And uh, thank you again for stepping up to the to the stage, right? Um, so, yeah, I, I am in the middle of this book. I've got about 200 pages of it. And it is called Victim to Valiant. And it is about the topic that we're talking about today. And I did bring this up because I was put in a position where I very easily could have fallen back into my own habit of being the victim of playing that pity card, getting that sympathy, using emotional manipulation to get what I wanted to make sure that my friend felt bad for their actions. But the truth is, is I felt much more empowered when I kept to myself, I processed my emotions on my own. And I told my, you know, I, I recognized that the situation was uncomfortable. The situation was not something I wanted to be in. I love my friend. And I understood where she was coming from. But I also felt betrayed and I felt abandoned in that situation. And I was like, you know what? I'm not okay with being treated this way. I've known my friend for 16 years. They know me well enough that ditching me at a party, especially when I'm a guest at this house, you know, being ditched for this, this situation was just not something that I felt was, um, it was respectful. Maybe my standards are too high, but that's, those are my standards, those standards I set for myself. And so I left, I said no, and I left. And despite her going through the motions of begging me to come back, Telling me she was sorry she was a jerk. Did she actually tell me what she did wrong? No, she didn't um, take the accountability, which is, I, I, once again, consider that a standard when you are apologizing to somebody, recounting what you did wrong to let the other person know that you understand, that you understand the damage you did. You understand what your actions 
did to that other person, I, I think that that is only fair. Because if I'm going to trust someone again, if I'm going to spend time with them and I'm going to go to another party with them, uh, I need to know that if they decide to make that choice again, that they know the consequence, that they know that that's not, a, that's not an appropriate way to treat me and that I'm not going to stick around for that. But this friend was like, oh, um, she blamed the alcohol. And she blamed the, the fact that uh, the, the party was over and that, you know, but I was like, but you lied to me. You said you were going to be right back and you weren't right back, right? So for me, it was, these were a lot of excuses. She was never taking responsibility for her actions. You might say, well, fine. She, she you know, she's being mean. Fine, whatever. The truth is, is, if I was in that situation and I was the one that ditched my friend and went and did my own thing, with um, some guy somewhere in the house and my friend was vis visibly hurt and I could see she was crying and hurt. I know I would, you know, I always put my friends before romantic interests as just a personal standard once again that I have for myself. And I would leave that person and I would go and talk to my friend, especially a friend of 16 years. But I have been put recently in situations where I had to take accountability. Um, in fact, I was emotionally distraught after the situation. I went to my parents' house. My parents are in their 70s. They're older people. They don't like seeing me upset, right? Um, once again, when something bad happens to you, being a victim isn't necessarily the emotions that you have. It's the reaction that you have. And it's, it's lacking the boundaries to know like that people shouldn't treat you that way again. When you're a victim, you keep making choices that allow you to continue being a victim in a situation. You know, you can be a victim in one situation, put your foot down and you're no longer a victim, right? But the victim mentality is that like, it was somebody else's fault and I'm not able to take responsibility for the situation. I apologized to my friend. I was like, I'm sorry I left and I hurt your feelings. I didn't feel safe. I left. You know, that, that's my choice. I'm allowed to leave if I don't feel safe. That's my right as a, as a human, especially as a woman. <laughs> I'm allowed to leave a, an uncomfortable situation. But I apologize. I hurt your feelings. I'm so sorry. I am so sorry I left without saying goodbye. Those are things I can apologize for. Those are things I did, and I know they hurt her. But I'm not going to apologize for leaving. No, I'm not apologizing for leaving at all. I'm apologizing for leaving without saying goodbye. And I'm apologizing for, for uh, hurting her feelings when I left. Because obviously she expected me to stay. But I'm not going to apologize for leaving. Um, but when I was at my parents' house, I got emotionally distraught. My parents were giving advice. They were trying to fix the problem that was already fixed. And I was just processing emotions. Um, and I told my parents, like, hey, I appreciate your advice. I appreciate, you know, the care, but I just need to kind of, like, feel this out and just vent about it for a little bit. And my parents being the nurturers they are, they wanted so badly to solve the problem. So they continued to give me advice, and I snapped at them. Uh, I was rude. I, I did have a, a little emotional snappage at my parents, and I immediately felt very guilty. Now I could just be like, well, my parents triggered me. It was their fault. You know, how dare my parents, you know, put their noses where they don't belong, you know? No. My parents from the love and caring of their heart wanted to alleviate my discomfort in the situation by giving advice. And they were not very effective at it. <laughs> they weren't the most effective at it and inadvertently triggered me but I'm responsible for my reactions. I'm responsible for the way I talk to people. I am responsible for my emotions and how I handle them. So after I had an outburst, I went up to my little room and I took some time to breathe 
use some of the practices in my book, Victim to Valiant. I grounded, I centered myself, I cleared my energy, and I created a shield to protect myself so that I could really understand what emotions were mine and what emotions were from this outside situation. And I returned downstairs and I apologized to both my parents. I said, I am so grateful that you guys want to help. I'm so grateful that you guys see me in pain and have wisdom of all your lives to, to share on, you know, with me to help, help me solve the situation and like fix my friendship. But I am not comfortable like fixing this right now. Like I just need to vent. My mom was really understanding. She appreciated my apology. You know, I apologize for snapping at them. I apologize for being short. I'm responsible for my actions. As you can hear, I'm very self-aware. And my parents, um, my mom actually cried because uh, this was kind of the first time she's seen me applying. It's, I haven't seen my parents in probably three years now. This is the first time since the beginning of COVID. Um, I see my parents and my my mom cried because uh, I used to be bipolar and had like very, very unhealthy emotional responses to situations. And so my mom was worried that this situation with my friend was going to cause like this extreme emotional response. And um, she was proud that I was handling it so well. And she was like, I'm, you know, hearing what you're saying, I feel a lot more confident, like just letting you handle it yourself. I think people, all of us are just trying to do our best. My friend was just trying to do her best to cope with her pain. And unfortunately, I was a casualty in that. My parents were trying their best to solve my pain. And unfortunately, they made me uncomfortable in the process because they took my power away for me to solve my own problem myself. And in both of these situations, I set my boundary. You know, yes, I had a bad reaction the second time, but I did come back around. I took responsibility for my actions, for my emotions. I could have very easily been like, uh, you know, I'm in an emotional distress from this situation with my friend. Like, you guys should know better. You should know better than to try and, like, talk to me when I'm this upset. Like, I could do that. Be easy. It would be so easy to blame my emotional response and me talking back to my parents, me being rude to my parents as like, you know, a victim response. Like, you guys know I'm going through so much. Like, how dare you? And most people would. I'm sorry, I was just under so much stress. Now the problem with, I'm sorry, I was just under so much stress is you're using your stress as an excuse to treat people poorly. You're not taking accountability for the fact that you made the choice, no matter what kind of mental, emotional, physical state you were in. You could have walked away. We have feet. We've got legs, most of us. And if you don't, usually you have a chair or crutches, right? You can walk away. You can leave the situation. Set a boundary. If the person doesn't respect your boundary, what do you do? You ask for help from someone else. You know, and if somebody's not respecting your boundaries, that should be a huge red flag not to interact with that person again. If you're in an altercation and you're like, you know what, I need to walk, I need to take a walk, I need to cool down, I need to get a level head, and the person won't let you walk away. That is intimidation. That that is on the abuse scale. It's not high on the abuse scale. But that is intimidation. That's manipulation of your emotions. That's making you feel trapped in a situation. That's all, all abusive behavior. Everybody that does it isn't necessarily an abuser, but it's not a healthy behavior to have to make somebody feel safe for somebody to have the, the space and the time to be able to like really look at their situation, look at the way they're responding and to be mature about it. So changing the victim mentality isn't just how you change what you do in reaction to bad situations. It's also changing what you do when you are the bad situation. 
taking accountability, standing up for the fact that you know you did something wrong, that you are human, and that it's okay as long as you are owning it, you're apologizing for it, and that you know that you're going to work harder on making sure that that doesn't happen again. As long as you care about the other person, you don't want that to happen again. If you do something vindictive and you want to own that, own it. Be a, you know, be vindictive. That's part of the human condition, right? But you're not a victim in that case. You can't play the victim in that case. If there are consequences for being vindictive or jealous or, you know, even being angry, there are going to be consequences. We have to also know that we have to own those consequences. Like, yeah, I had a very unhealthy emotional response to the situation. I own that. It's okay. I have known people who had really bad victim responses where they would like take their anger out on people, slash tires, and, you know, do horrible things. And they owned it. It was like, yeah, I know I do this. I have anger problems. And it's like, they're no longer the victim when they own that. If you want to be the person who cries and just wants to like hide and never come out, that's okay. It's okay to cry. That doesn't make you a victim for crying, for being upset. You're human. You should be upset. Process those emotions. Let them out. If you suppress them, you're going to get unhealthy anyway. Like, if you're, if you're suppressing how you truly feel about situations and about how people treat you, then you're going to have real confusion moving forward in your next scenario where people treat you poorly. Because if you're not giving yourself permission to cry, you're, you're not giving yourself permission to be upset or angry or frustrated or confused. And you're just like, these are uncomfortable feelings. I have to suppress them then what happens the next time? Your body's not going to know how it's supposed to feel because you keep telling it that it's not safe to feel those things. It's like, oh yeah, body, you feel these things, but guess what? Shh. You're wrong. Shh. That doesn't feel good, so shut up. You can't tell your body to shut up. You're not trusting yourself. Let it out. Be healthy about it. Get yourself out of that situation. Go express yourself somewhere else. But being sad or upset or crying doesn't make you a victim. It's when you make it other people's problems. <laughs> you give excuses. That's, that's, that's when it's victim mentality. And yes, I've, I've talked about my own personal experience recently and how easy it could have been to be a victim. But we see victim mentality everywhere. It's in the news. It's in our politics. It's, <laughs> it's everywhere. We see it with uh, employers. We see it with coworkers. We see it in our friends and their relationships. We see it with our celebrities who are supposed to be our role models, right? Why? Why have we come to such a, such a place in our society where people are struggling to take responsibility for their emotions, for their reactions, and for the way they treat other people? If you treat someone poorly, guilt is a natural response. And the emotion is there to teach you a lesson. Oh, this didn't feel good to hurt my friend this way. You don't make it their problem. You recognize that this bad feeling is the consequence of your actions. This is the natural consequence of doing something bad. You know? And if you feel a negative feeling in your body, I dropped off and now I'm back. <laughs> Yeah, so if you feel a negative feeling in your body and you don't know what it is, do some soul searching. 
there's so many emotions to feel. And sometimes we have multiple emotions stacked on top of each other. So many emotions to weed through, especially in complex situations. Whether it be best friends, whether it be betrayal or abandonment, or if there's trauma, you know, being triggered in a situation, that's when things get complicated. And it gets easier to be the victim, to not try and empower yourself. It's easy for people to pity you. Of course it is. That's how, that's how children get what they want. They cry and they play the victim, right? Well, they're not really old enough to do much, much better for themselves. It's very odd being in a world where there's so many people doing that. I see it in my toddler. I see that behavior, like the subconscious behavior in my toddler. And it's almost as if an entire generation never learned how to empower themselves, how to, how to set boundaries, how to be strong in their conviction, how to know that their emotions and the way they're feeling is valid and more than just valid, but acceptable normal you should be angry if someone stabs you in the back or betrays you you should also feel sad you should also feel confused and rejected is it their problem well it will be when you stop talking to them because suddenly they're not getting all of those wonderful emotions off of you anymore suddenly you've cut you've cut that connection because you're taking care of yourself you're processing all those feelings and you're realizing you don't really want to spend time with somebody who makes you feel that way and if you're in a relationship where you really care about the person like i love the character of this person i have so much fun with this person but there are situations where i don't feel good and these are the the emotions i have to deal with what do you do then how do you, how do you, you know, how, how do you set boundaries when you're living with someone? How do you set boundaries when you're in a relationship with someone? You tell them, you tell them where your boundary is. And if they don't want to respect that, then you need to make a decision. Are you willing to sacrifice the feeling of safety and respect from the person that you, you believe you love? Can someone really love you if they're not showing you respect? If they're not taking the time to understand why you might have a problem with their behavior? Is it really mutual love if they don't care that they're hurting you? And if you're like, oh yeah, well he promised. He promised he'd change. She promised she'd change. They promised they'd never do it again. Great. Awesome. But did they? How many months went by before they did it again? Because hmm? that's, that's a cycle. It's easy to make empty promises. It's so easy. I can make an empty promise to you guys now. I'm going to be here for another 30 minutes. <laughs> Will I? Probably not. Probably not. I wanted to come on and, sh and, and talk about this because nobody really does. Nobody really talks about this. Yes, we cover victim mentality a little bit, but nobody really talks very deeply about this topic. There's a lot there because in order for there to be a victim, there has to be someone making a poor choice. And in order for somebody to be victimized, they have to allow that, that person power to victimize them. You can't be a victim if you leave a situation. You can't be a victim if you say, huh, okay, you want to treat me like that? Okay, bye. Then there's just a jerk. And the person who didn't want to deal with a jerk. Right? So, I know I've rambled now. And I did 
opened the floor quite a while ago for anybody who wanted to share any stories or get advice on situations where they might be feeling victimized in their own life. Maybe recent situations that didn't go so well. Maybe the huge fight happened or, you know, maybe maybe you lost a friend because of the way you reacted or because of how they reacted or, you know, maybe you're in a relationship that makes you feel victimized or confused and you're like, I have no idea. The floor is yours if you want it. Um, I will probably be wrapping up here in the next 15 minutes. So that's going to be your, you know, I've got time for one or two people to hop on up and talk. But I'd love to know what you guys think of, of this topic. I do want to talk more about it in hopes of kind of like, you know, sharing, sharing some of the topics I cover in my book, Victim to Valiant. Um, I, I will be coming out with that very soon. And, um, I just wanted to start, start kind of opening people up to this topic and, and healing this aspect of themselves. As you can tell, I'm still working on it myself, but had I been put in that situation that I described earlier in the talk, um, at a different point in my life, when I didn't recognize these things about myself about being victimized, I would have handled that situation very differently. You know, the way it went was friend ditched me. I cried. I left right. Um, in the future or in the, in the past, I probably would have cried and made it everybody else's problem. I would have made a big old scene. I would have made her feel super embarrassed. And I would have utilized the fact that she's a caring friend and used that against her. Not consciously, obviously, you guys, but we all know how emotional manipulation works. Oh, someone's in the waiting room. Thank you so much for uh, Greg. Greg, for joining. Thank you so much for hopping on and being a part of the talk today. It takes a lot of courage to come up. And, and so thank you, Greg. Hey, Rainbow, how are you doing? I'm good. How are you? I am well. Um, what's your opinion on... Why you think we are seeing the um, explosive proliferation, that's a mouthful, of victimization or victimhood in society? And roughly when do you think did it start? So I, I did, I don't know when you hopped on, but I did like briefly notice that there is like, I mentioned that I, I'm noticing it. It's like prevalent right now in this society. Mm -hmm. And whether or not it was prevalent before my era right? because I only have experience in my own lifetime but I think it was a lot more more covert women were not allowed to speak out really until 80s 90s it was a little bit in the 70s but it was more hippy dippy movement there wasn't really you know there was the women empowerment movement but there was not it, it wasn't as open as it is now. There was women still would have been judged for coming out in the seventies. So this, I think because there's, you know, there's, there's a, a demographic now with women, right? Um, I'm not saying it's just women, but we are being encouraged to, to share our stories more. And with sharing your stories, there also comes a sense of pity me, right? Um, especially if you're telling your story for the first time, it's it's not necessarily you're not usually sharing your story the first time to to help people learn. You're sharing it because you need the healing yourself. Mm -hmm. You're sharing because you want to know that other people hear you. And you want to make sure you're not crazy as hell. You know, you don't share a story because you, you want people to be like, you weren't crazy. You were right in that situation. You want people to stand beside you and tell you you were in the right. Right. Mm -hmm. But what does that create? It does create victim mentality because suddenly you're the victim. Right. Because you have all these people agreeing with you that this bad thing happened to you and you were in the right and the other person was in the wrong. And suddenly what you were looking for, which was um, just people to see you, people to appreciate you, right? P people to like relate to you and your experience. 
what do you need any more? You don't need more than that in that moment. I, I think what's You're not being asked, I, I think what might be happening in society is as, as we see a proliferation of of being a victim, and it appears that there are more yep. classes and when I say classes, I mean divisions of categories of being a victim. What happens is is that ups the ante for the next victim to tell their story. And th- and then it's my victim, my exactly. being victimized exactly. is bigger than your being victimized. And then we have this big dog pile going on and it just keeps That's getting right. bigger and bigger. Does that make sense? Yep. Yeah. I agree. And now I, I do want to throw in just because I I do strongly believe that domestic abuse and how women, I, I'm a woman, so I'm going to speak from my experience, how women are treated needs to change. And that when women share our stories, it gives other women permission to also know that they're not alone, that they can share their stories too. But then we are also not taking the next step as as a collective, you know. And that's kind of why I decided to write this book is because, you know, before the Me Too movement happened, I had had a lot of those experiences. I, I told people and I was shunned for telling people because... Nobody wants to hear that shit. Yeah. Right. It was like, oh my God, the dr- the girl with the drama, get rid mm. of her. Yeah. Right. And especially men, it's not a comfortable subject to sit through. And a lot of women who have been put in those situations, we we change the way we see men. We saw them as potential partners. We saw them as someone we could be friend. We saw them as someone we could just hang out with and have fun with. And suddenly after that situation. It's not safe. What if the next one, you know, that last one seemed really nice, but that didn't go so well. And I think the thing is a lot of, a lot of people who, who haven't experienced it, don't understand what that does to the psyche and your level of trust and your ability to function in society. And instead of us like creating this movement where we're all like, we support you, you know, yes, tell us your story. And, you know, yeah, you're a victim. Don't worry about it. No. Because it can happen and probably will with that, with that mental state, it probably will happen again. Yeah, the, we, we need to give them tools. We need to give people in general, men, women alike, we need to give them tools how to handle these victimizing situations. Yeah, the, I don't disagree with that. Um, but when it becomes politicized and then taxpayers are expected Absolutely. to pick up the tab for this, this is when we have an even bigger problem. One thing I've noticed I didn't really think about it because I stayed away from TV for so many years. Um, Now that I look at my memories in the early 1980s in Hollywood, which is, by the way, a tiny fraction of the entire population. But people think that what they no, but they do. They do make more money than every country on the entire planet. Hollywood, they they do. Just the city. What I'm talking about is just that group of people that do that professionally are a tiny sliver of the entire population. So small. But yep. society thinks that that's not not everyone, but it, we, it appears that more people think the way they think, and that's not true. But what I'm saying is, is yep. when I look back in the early 1980s, in in TV, men have been portrayed as complete idiots mm-hmm. who can't even tie their shoes, and it's still popular. And and this is not about me being a guy. I don't mm-hmm. care about any of that. I think a big, not at all. Movies, no, 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 I not mean, all. Look at the old things, generally. Whatever, and- you know, Generally that, speaking, men are portrayed it, it as idiots. It depends on the, the movies you're watching, but yes, yeah. I do see where you're coming from with that. And yeah. but if we look at women, they're always seen as either the slut or the easy girl or the romantic interest who's just pretty. We yeah, never see that, the funny fat girl it, starring in the movie. <laughs> you no, know what? It's, it's just Hollywood. Is well, all it is. <laughs> I think a big part of this can be a part of this can be solved if people would just stop giving their money to Hollywood and just turn that crap off. Just turn it off. Yep. Yep. And really, how much satisfaction do we really get from watching other people live their lives when we could very easily be living the life we so wish we could by living vicariously through these other people? My mic is uh, out of time. Taking the action. Yeah, my mic. Can I actually talk about, oh, you can can hop back on, by the way, Greg. I'm enjoying this. Um, So feel free to hop back on. But I I definitely believe that we... uh, you're right. I think television does create the perfect presidents, the perfect environment for this to breed um, more of more, more of this victimization because 
it's like, well, it's their fault, right? And we could even blame Hollywood. Let's go ahead. Let's let's just uh, hypothetically say it's Hollywood's fault. But it's not because we're having this discussion. You have your own mind. By the way, you're on mute if you're trying to talk. Um, we all have our own minds. We can definitely uh, change our perspective because it really does come down to our perspective. You are only a victim if you believe you're a victim. You can only be victimized if you believe that you have no power against the other person doing you wrong. Um, once again, Greg, you're welcome to hop back on. You are on mute. So you're, you're still timed in, but you are on mute. Um, but yeah, that's, you brought up a great point. It, Hollywood does create this, uh, this example for our society to follow. And so many of us are following it, whether it be through YouTube or TikTok or television, the news, political figures, um, what, whatever side doesn't even freaking matter because they're all playing that victim card at this point. So Greg, you're welcome to queue back up. I know that the app has issues. I, I have issues myself with the app, so don't, don't feel bad. Um, I do like that he brought that up. Um, I like that he asked where I thought it was coming from. I, I do believe that Hollywood has a huge impact on, on how we view ourselves and view the roles we take in relationships and situations. Welcome back. Greg. Thanks. It, it's <laughs> on my end. It's not yours. The, I, no, no, no. The, I have issues with the app as well, yeah. but guess what? We have the power to we, not be victimized do. by this app. That's right. I'm on my I'm on my desktop. That's why the timer is off. The I think what this gets back to, and this is really overused, but it is true. The nuclear family is being destroyed from within, and that's a big part of why we're talking about what we're talking about. Hmm. Can you um, explain more about? Uh, what your definition of nuclear family just just a is. basic family i mean the, the standard okay, model so like, of a family that's all yeah and you're right that's kind of a vague term okay you know okay. and it, there's but society yeah. is also changing so our model of family is also changing now i know that a lot of people in their 30s and 20s refuse to get married and you would say that that you know that's being destroyed now do you know why they refuse to get married do you think it's just because they don't want to take responsibility or they have commitment issues? It depends on the couple. It totally does, right? Yeah. Well, I know from my own personal perspective, a lot of people that I know that refuse to get married, they've been in relationships for 10 plus years. It's not because they're noncommittal. They've been with someone for 10 years. They have kids. They have a house. They share assets. It's usually because they had a family member who had to go through a divorce. They know how expensive the wedding is. We're talking tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars being invested in this union only to then have to separate legally. And the legal fees of that, once again, are tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands, depending on how, you know, civil people are in that uh, agreement. The, what I'm what I'm talking it, it, about, yeah. what, you're, what we're talking about is a legal contract with the state. That's what a marriage license is. That is not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is yeah. a man and a woman joining together and having kids. That's what I'm talking about when I say nuclear family. The marriage mm -hmm. means nothing. The piece of paper means nothing to me. It's irrelevant. Yeah. yeah. So you think that the very core of all of society is including young people or, you know, people in their teens – no, that, when I that, when I say a family, what I'm talking about is is if you and I start a family today, we're a man and a woman, yeah. we come together and we stay together, committed, and we have children, right? That would be the loose yeah. definition of a nuclear family. So, yeah, yeah and I, that's I all that. I'm talking about. But I'm saying that victimization. Well, what you know, because that, that's that's what we're talking about, well, right? What, <laughs> well, the, what I'm saying is is we have to go back to the beginning, at least in my estimation. It starts with the nuclear family. Then we can open up this conversation to something called the rise of feminism and what it's doing to this country. And I think that's a big part of what we're talking about. You understand what I'm saying about this? The that, you see, there's a the there's, dynamic. I'm a woman 
And I could very easily be like, yeah, I'm a feminist. But the thing is, as I notice that with feminism, there also is that victimization element. Yes. Um, I believe in equality. I definitely have noticed in my own personal experience of having jobs, being in the workforce among men, that there is inequality. For example, my first job when I was 16, 17, my manager sexually harassed me every single day. Do men usually have to deal with that? Do men have to deal with strangers touching their butts in front of customers and having to smile and act like it's some kind of a joke just because it's embarrassing? Not usually. No. Not usually. That And a lot of guys don't know that this is going on. This is very common. And why women refuse to work normal, regular jobs is because this is very, very common. And we don't speak out about it. Why? Because victimization of the males happens. Oh, but they were they were wearing a, inappropriate clothes. We have the same dress codes as you guys. It's just because we've got boobs and you guys don't. That's the only difference here, you know? Well, let me, let me say this. I'm 53 years well, old. I've been working in banking for 22 years now. Nobody has ever played grab ass in my presence ever the entire time. So it depends on the industry that you work in. It might. Yeah. It might. Yeah. I've never been a banker. That's okay. But, you know, the thing is, is you said in your presence. And that's the difference is it doesn't usually happen in other people's presence. It happens on breaks in the break room yeah. or when everybody, you know, leaves the office and every, you know, the last two people are cleaning up or whatever. And it's really embarrassing to be at, a, you know, there's an obvious power dynamic where women have less of an upper hand, you know, not, not, not if you interview the feminist, they don't. Well, that's why I say I'm not a feminist. Yeah, and I'm not saying that you are, but I understand. And here's the thing. Yeah, here's yeah. the thing. <laughs> Government doesn't need to, be, get, need to be getting involved in this shit. Okay. Sexual harassment lawsuits exploded in this country. It's a part of our culture. We're stuck they with did. it. But so did so did uh, divorces well, in the 90s. I, I understand that. But what I'm saying is this, is if I go into a job and someone starts grabbing me, that, that's assault. I either assault them back to protect yep. myself or I go find another job. I don't hire yep. a freaking attorney and force government to extract money exactly. from this, this company. They'll eventually go out of business. Yep. And that's what happened with me is I left the job. But the thing is, is I tried to go what is encouraged to be the route, which is talk to your manager, right? Talk to your manager. Um, so I had a, the manager was the one who was, assault, you know, harassing me, mm -hmm. touching me inappropriately and saying inappropriate things. By the way, I was underage. And so I went to his manager. I was like, Hey, this is inappropriate. Guess what he just said? Deal with it. He said, I'll talk to him. I'll talk to him. Yeah. Um, but you need to stop this behavior. And I was like, what behavior I've been doing my job. Yeah. Right. And what, just me existing is enough of an excuse for this person to act inappropriately. No, and he not. didn't get punished, but it's I got, I got let go. It's not because I was just you just were working for the wrong company and it wasn't your fault. You didn't, you exactly. didn't make a wrong decision. You're dealing with someone who has the mentality of a horny 13 year old boy. Right. Exactly. And he was in his forties. Yeah. Right. Move on. But the thing is, is, you know, yes, you're right. Government shouldn't get involved. But what do you do when you have a manager acting like that and he does have more power over the other employees and the women, if we're not being heard, oh, I'll just pop you back in. If we're not feeling heard in these job positions where we feel respected, if a man complained about a woman, it would be taken care of. It would be taken care of so fast. But if a woman says something, we're just being sensitive. There really is like a stigma about women and how we react in situations. The only reason that I'm able to talk about this from a non-emotional place is because I've worked very, very hard to develop a more uh, practical, analytical mind, which is valued in men's society, mm -hmm. so that I'm not reacting from an emotional place. But not all women have the life experience or even the circumstances to get them to that place. Agreed. And when trauma is involved, it becomes even more difficult because a lot of men don't understand the uh, the subconscious and psychological and physiological effects that trauma has on the body. 
And well, I, 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 I think, think you need to interview people that have been sent to prison and been raped as men. And that I think that yeah. might change your perspective. No, I've, not being I've, I've actually watched um, soft white underbellies. And I've, I've heard yeah, stories. It's sad. So I, I'm, I'm not saying yeah. that trauma is exclusive to women because it's not. Yeah, it is not in the slightest. In fact, I think most men go through trauma, too. But you guys suppress it and you don't talk about it as as openly as, as a lot of women do. Yeah. Once again, I'm not generalizing. This is from, you know, I have clients and I, I work with people one on one and I work on trauma. Like that's my my specialty is I help people understand, like, just because trauma happened to you doesn't need to be your life. And you can be yeah. empowered in knowing that you can change these circumstances. And I really like that you approach this with like, if your boss is treating you like shit, no matter leave. whether you're male leave. or female, yeah. leave. Yeah. And I, and I think one of the reasons. Don't worry about it. One of the reasons why it appears, one of the reasons why the sexual harassment culture pro proliferated, not only because men had been getting away with ridiculous shit for decades, centuries, actually, right? right. Is we had this yes. explosion Absolutely. of attorneys handling these cases. Now, the most common occupation yep. for people on Capitol Hill happens to be attorney. So it's ingrained in our culture, and I don't think it's going anywhere anytime soon. So. It is. And it, it didn't used yeah. to be. But, I mean, we had all those shows, Law and Order, and, you know, like, it really became, like, it became public knowledge yeah. that you have these pow this power. Mm -hmm. And we really shouldn't be upset if women decide to, to use the power that we as Americans have the right to you. You know, and I, I do believe that you're right. In many circumstances, in many, many circumstances, it is much better and easier to take your power back by s just walking away. But yeah. there are circumstances where you can't, where somebody is blackmailing you, where somebody is putting you in a position where really they've taken all your power away. What happens when your your boss, you decide to quit and now they won't write you a, a you know, a, a review for your next job Oh well, just because he's oh. upset because you, you didn't, I'm not staying. Do whatever I'm not staying just sexual. because I can't get a good referral letter. I'm not going to stay there and and be exposed yep. to that shit. I'm not going to do it. Ex yeah. yeah. And and by the a way, a lot of women these though, days, we might not have the education to to just be able to take up another job, or you know, maybe this was their first job, and now what do they do? You know, it, they, it they is go out, they go out, and they basis. find new work is what they do. Right. Instead of sitting yeah. around and complaining about getting blackmailed, that means if I'm getting blackmailed, then I got involved in something I shouldn't have been getting involved in. That's what yeah. blackmail is. But it all comes down to educating the public about these situations and how to handle them, giving them the tools, giving women and men emotional tools and, you know, psychological tools because I mean, there really is a lot of psychological damage that goes into a situation like that. How do you come out of it? It's understanding how to reframe your your mind, how to change your perspective and know that like you have that power in that situation. But it can be very difficult because, I mean, I know I was very early on program to believe that I just had to suck it up. Yeah, you I know, was actually having I, this. I'm, I'm the princess, I'm the princess. And, you know, everybody's a bad guy until my Prince Charming comes to save me. We're expecting someone to step in and save us. And well, that's, and that, see, that's the role, that's the so role the government has taken. Everybody wants daddy to handle everything for them. And that's what government has become. So yep. it's, it, it's a snowball, but anyway. Um, it is, but you also, you have to recognize that a lot of lawsuits are not just women. They're men too. And men yeah. are taking advantage of the legal system, but of course we're not going to shun, you know, shame them. Yeah. Because that's their natural born right. They're men. They get to, you know, good for you, sir, for suing your boss for, yeah. you know, whatever. But why Why is it different when a woman decides to do the same? Why, why is it suddenly that she's playing the victim role? Because she decides to utilize the judicial system that we are given as, as Americans and stand up for herself. Yes, you can see it as drama. But if a man is suing another man, it's not drama. That's considered like, oh, yes, look, look at him. He's using our our legal system correctly. Good for him. 
But why, think, when a woman does it, is it a negative thing? Well, w one thing I do know is is that women have more power now than they've ever had in society. That's 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 good. That's, yeah, that's statement number one. <laughs> statement number two, and I can only speak to my industry. Twenty one years in banking. Yep. You, there, there is not this mentality. There was many, many years ago in banking. It was male dominated. It's not anymore. In the bank that I work at, and the culture I've yep. been in for over two decades. You don't even think about putting a hand on a woman's ass. You will be out on the street immediately as a man if you do that. Oh, yeah, second. you will. And, and there's no yep, unions and, in banking. We don't form unions nope. and demand more money and better rights and all these other things. We don't do it. No. So anyway, no. listen, thank you for letting me in. I appreciate it. Absolutely. And thank you for it. sharing because I, I really appreciate hearing your perspective and for bringing up some – some things that you've experienced and why you have the perspective you do. Cause that, that really helps me with being able to approach um, helping others. Absolutely. Have a good one. You too. Bye. Bye. So thank you so much to Greg for coming on and bringing up some of those, those topics. Cause those are hard topics to talk about. And it, once again, I could have been, so, it would have been so easy to been like, well, I'm a woman. I'm, you know, I've been in the society. I could have been so reactive to some of the things that Greg brought up. And I think a lot of women would, because it does feel like a personal attack against our personal experience, women's personal experience in the workforce, our personal experiences as individuals. Right. But I see where he's coming from. And I do understand how it can look that way. And I actually have a friend, she's a woman, <laughs> surprise, right? Um, she's actually having to sue her boss. Um, and that may sound bad. I'm sure Greg's sitting there going, oh, I hate this girl. No, but I encouraged her to. I, uh, she just wanted to leave her job. She is a single mom. Her, her ex was uh, involved in drugs and is now um, in jail because he was very badly in that scene um, and he threatened to kill her and I told her to call the cops and so he got taken care of, right? Um, but her boss fired her because she caught COVID. Now, this is not a you know, sexual harassment thing. This is, you're not legally allowed to fire somebody for having COVID, especially like right after a pandemic, you guys, right? Now, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm incorrect in my assessment of how legal that actually is. But um, because she was sick and she got fired um, and she had to go then try and apply for unemployment. And of course, her boss had to explain why she was getting unemployment, you know, why she she was fired. And um, a lot of drama came from it. And suddenly this boss was lying about their reasoning for for firing her because, oh, you're being faced with uh, having to take responsibility for firing an employee for an illegal reason. And so sh she wasn't allowed to get um, unemployment because the boss had lied about what they had fired her for or whatever. And so I told her she's in a bad position. She's still dealing with um, some of the aftermath of, of COVID. Um, now, whether you believe in COVID or not, I don't know. Uh, I just know that my friend was very ill. She was in bed for three weeks. Um, she doesn't have friends or family help, help her take care of her son. Her son got sick too. And um, her body is fighting a bunch of infections uh, I, that I guess uh, COVID had caused. This is what her doctor said. I've read what her doctors have written. So she's having a lot of health issues now. And she's not able to take on another job because she is still in bed. She's still not even well enough to like go out and, and like go shopping or anything for her kid and her. So I told her that she needs to take legal action. I'm hoping that her her job will just um, accept the settlement. That's how you avoid court, by the way, you guys. <laughs> you go in with a settlement amount, um, how much damage this has done. You know, she's had to pay for doctor's appointments and medications and getting health, you know, her health taken care of while she's not employed where she would have had benefits and stuff. So for me... I encouraged her to take that route because whether she was a single mom or a bachelor male, I would have given her the same advice. Your boss fired you illegally. He has put you in a position where you are now at a financial disadvantage. 
and getting a job is going to take time. So she, she deserves compensation, financial compensation for this unpredictable. And, uh, you know, she couldn't, she couldn't have done anything to avoid this situation in my, in my eyes, you know, I'm not an attorney. Please do not, you know, I, this is just my personal opinion. I told her to talk to an attorney and the attorney believes she has a case and that they're going to come up with a settlement amount and, you know, um, approach this employer with the settlement amount. And hopefully they agree, understanding that they broke the law and that they need to take responsibility for their actions. And if they don't, that's when it goes to court. And I think what Greg was talking about, about, you know, he, he believes that, you know, there's a lot of people abusing our judicial system. And I've noticed that there are a lot of people, women included in this, lying about situations uh, that maybe were not necessarily true, or maybe they lied to themselves about the situation. And because of their own personal shame, they uh, took it to court, right? But that all comes down to the same thing I've been talking about. How you change victim mentality, I think all of us, every single one of us, even if we don't think we are a, someone who, who falls into victim mentality, I think it's really important that we understand where empowerment, where manipulation, and where, you know, victimization, where those lines really are. And living your truth and knowing when it's okay to like set a boundary, like, is it okay for your boss to fire you for having COVID? And if we really let that boss get away with that, like, what, what example does that set for the other companies out there that they can just fire people for getting COVID? You know, she, she really does need to, to set a precedent because this is not a very common thing yet. It's, it's good that she's doing that. That's a personal opinion on mine. You don't have to agree with it. But I know that's what I encouraged her to do. And I, I, I do agree. There are people taking a lot of advantage of our judicial system because it's easy to be a victim. It's, it's important to know where that line is when it's a form of empowerment and when it's a form of, well, trying to get pity from people, trying to get revenge on people, trying to be vindictive, trying to, you know, I want him to really get it. I want him to feel the pain. I want, I want to take that business down. I hated working for that company. Those things, you guys, those things, there's a difference between that and, oh my gosh, this person put me in such a bad financial situation that I can't get out right now. I need, I need time. You know, I need time and I need resources so that I can get myself back in a better position. That is when you should, you should utilize the legal system that has been set up for us is when it's not to get, you know, to get back at someone when it really is, you know, I don't want to say self-preservation, but in a way it is self-preservation. It's, it's understanding that, you know, you deserve that. You were put in a position that is not going to help you right now. And, um, you know, that, that they need to, there needs to be a consequence for their actions as a, as a corporation, as a company. So uh, that was, I wanted to throw that out there, Greg, so that you could hear that because um, I didn't get to share while you were on. But um, I do agree. I do agree that there's a lot of that. And I hear what he's saying in regards to to feminism. And I've actually heard a lot of men talk about this, where, where men are feeling, um, I don't, you know, it is a form of victimization. But I think that there's also a level of, uh, they're feeling like their, their role is being threatened, like they're like the norm is changing and being threatened. And that can pose a lot of uncertainty and a lot of anger and frustration. And I've heard men talk about how like, oh yeah, a feminist movement is really hurting men's, men's abilities to like get lifelong partners and like start families because they're raised to believe that at a certain point in their life, they should settle down with children and have a wife who takes care of them and 
you know, that, that the woman is supposed to make them dinner every night and make them breakfast in bed. She's supposed to do all the laundry and all the chores and she's supposed to take care of the home and the children. She's supposed to stay at home and not work a job. And he's supposed to go off to work. And if anybody, if any woman decides that they want something other than that, then she's, she's, you know, being bad or that she's not, you know, you know, that she's not doing her job as a woman. But do we not hear how that takes away a lot of the personal freedoms that women are, should be allowed to make on our own? You know, like, we're all human. If, if a man was told that he had to live a certain way and that these were roles that were expected out of him, and what if he really didn't want to do that? You know, what if those roles didn't benefit that person in their life? What if that kept them from discovering the cure to cancer? Or what if that kept them from, you know, exploring the world? We have someone here in the waiting room. We've got Mojo, Joseph Mojo. Thank you so much, Mojo, for joining us, coming on up and talking. I really appreciate you. Nice to meet you, Mojo. Hey, I appreciate you. You too as well. I don't, I don't think I've met you before, so it's a pleasure to make a new friend. Yes, nice to meet you as well. So what do you think about all this? I don't know how long you've been tuned in. I've been in uh, for a few minutes and... Um, you know, the last thing I heard was what if men had, you know, certain expectations that they had to live up to. And, and they do. Uh, every they do, every right? category, they do. every division, every label has its expectations. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. From the time I was right. little, you know, I uh, I grew up in an era where my my dad in particular, who, who represented his generation very much um, was, hey, you, you never cry. You don't ever, yep. you know, don't ever let him see you sweat. Mm -hmm. If you get hurt, you right. just shake it off, rub some dirt in it, get going, you know, be a man, yep. all these mantras, which was, which my dad had inherited from his, his dad, of course. Yep. And so I grew up thinking that to be a man was to be tough and to not cry yep. and to not be in touch with my emotions mm -hmm. and certainly not be feminine or have any expression of femininity. And how did that, that work um, out and for I you? Have, <laughs> yeah yeah right exactly that's that's the right question right there exactly. that is the critical question for everyone because we all we are are given a set of expectations regardless of what label or mm -hmm. uh, category or division we fall into they mm -hmm. every label comes with a limit right and here we are what? limitless potential and yet we uh, just by the labels that we adopt and or have been given, they come with a set of expectations of what you can and cannot do. Well, that, that now alone, the question, I have a I'm question gonna... for you in regards yeah, to, to that. Please. So do you believe that the, the values and the morals and all of the things our parents raise us to believe and to value about ourselves and maybe even, you know, you know, we know we know that fathers say those things to protect their sons from, you know, discrimination and being sure. bullied. And, you know, it is a way to pretty much like put on a front so that you're not picked on. So you're not singled out. That's right. why parents, you know, why especially men encourage their children to do that. It's invalidating to a child's emotions and it causes a lot of emotional damage later. But in that moment when they're telling you that. It means it, it's it's there to help them, right? But once yeah. you leave your parents' house, do you believe that those values and morals and all of that is still outside of your control to, I don't know, change or shift? Just because you're given a label, it, it's only a label if you identify with it, right? It's only your label if you identify with yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah, of course. And um, unfortunately, you know, a, a lot of those labels are given to us or perhaps strapped over us 
uh, when we're in the formative mm -hmm. stages and we don't know, we don't have the critical thinking, our brains aren't fully formed to have this right. rational discussion with ourselves. Is that, is that really who I am? And mm -hmm. then you can couple that with the fact that we're all in flux. We're all changing all the time. Mm -hmm. So whatever label or division or category or mm -hmm. group that we identify with now, if we aren't really aware and open to the fact that I'm, I am, uh, I'm an, I'm alive, I'm changing, I'm yep. evolving all the time. Then those labels just because somebody says I'm fat doesn't the mean I is, have to be that, <laughs> right? Right, right. I hear you. Well, or, or um, in fact, in fact, when somebody says I'm that, it's actually not just that; it's my interpretation of what that means. Because exactly, someone's or interpretation of what, maybe what if what they're just saying is, that because they feel you know like they're trying to project their own insecurity of relating to that aspect of you onto you. So they're like, well, you know what? Sure. Um, my parents always said, if you're crying, then 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 you're a pussy. So. I see you crying right. over there. Yep. You're a pussy. You're a pussy. But on the inside, what's that kid really doing? Let's all just, let's all shout it out. They're crying on the inside because they are. Of course. You know? And, yep, of course. And what's funny is yeah. you're bringing this up. And as you're, you're sharing this, I'm also thinking about, you know, this is how my mind works, right? I'm like, hey, wait a second. Labels. What, what kind of problem are we having in society right now where people are shifting their labels and shifting their roles? And it's causing a yeah. lot of issues, right? right. I, we yeah. don't have to mention it, but I'm yeah. sure we all have it in mind. Um, maybe this is also really just a product of how far this vict victim mentality has gone and how damaging it has been for our young people and how we really never encourage them to realize that, yes, we as parents are giving them advice. But once they leave our house, they are free to be what they want to be. I think these kids that are doing their label changing, whatever that label is, I'm not going to point yeah, finger, yeah. fingers here. Pro pronouns I, or whatever, believe, yeah, even their pronouns. Yeah, yeah. Whatever. I, I think it is their way of re-empowering themselves in, it, you know, psychologically, nobody gave them tools. Nobody gave them, you know, how do they do that for themselves? This is how they have solved that problem. My dad told me that I'm a boy and that, you know, if I'm emotional, then maybe I'm not a boy. Come on, you guys. Everybody yeah. cries. We're humans. We I wouldn't just... have been born with tear ducts if we weren't supposed to cry. <laughs> like, let's talk about the, right. the, the, health, the health problems that come from repressing emotions. That is so damaging for a grown yeah. man when he finally does actually start to unpack his life's worth of trauma. Like, that's so that's such a ridiculous expectation and once you're an adult once you're a teenager moving into an adult life we need to remind people like hey that was how your parents thought you can't blame them for everything you're 50 you can't blame your parents for how they raised you anymore they're not raising you anymore <laughs> you know yeah. Yeah, like, mentality to me stop what, blaming your parents. <laughs> what i've been learning lately you know i i, I certainly have played the victim and blamed others and circumstances and everything outside of me for my troubles as much as anybody has. And what I'm learning Everyone, right? now, finally in my fifties, yeah, in my fifties, I'm finding that the, the true freedom is to release the blame and take responsibility. And, and right? for the longest time I resisted, resisted that because I thought I, I thought responsibility meant that was my fault. But I'm right? learning nope. to, to break that word in half and say, take response, responsibility, the ability to respond. That's my true power. Yep. Right. It's that it is. whatever stimulus, it's not whatever reacting. label, whatever expectations mm -hmm. that come to me. Yeah. It's having, it's having that maturity, right. And that, that agency to say, okay, whatever the, the expectations may be, yourself. whether they're internal or externally. Yeah. Yeah. Do yep. I have both the awareness and the consciousness to say, okay, I have the, I own the ability to respond regardless of whatever the labels and the limits and the expectations are. No matter what really the other person my does. Power as a human being, as a grown, ad yeah, as a grown adult, right. It's to whether accept or reject what I've been given to say, you know, labels are limits and I don't have to live under that constriction because I am an exquisite 
unlimited, boundless human being that the choices are are endless, right? And so I don't have to yep. identify with any one thing. And those 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 labels not only are limits, but they're divisions. And I'm saying that for me, happiness. I'm, I'm replacing the word happiness in my vocabulary with wholeness. And wholeness is embracing mm. all of those shards and pieces and brokenness and divisions that have become these limiting labels and say, what if I'm all of those things and just in varying degrees and not just yep. in this moment, but it, it, and it's but also that, that fluid. Too, you see, you're, you're, you're at a place in your life where you can, you can wrap your mind around that. Right. You've had enough experiences. Right. You can do that. Yeah. I think for younger people, that would cause a lot more confusion because I think that's almost like <laughs> that's almost like what's happening right now. Right. So. So I, I definitely agree, but I think there need to be steps to to understand the differences, the different labels, yeah. like at least at least your definition of these labels, your, your understanding of these labels, your. um recognition of these compartments and not necessarily compartmentalize them for yourself by the way you're welcome to come back in i see you got 15 seconds left um yeah, cool but to to um maybe not define yourself through labels and i'm noticing that when when people are trying to re-empower themselves they rename themselves or they give themselves a new identity but then they end up kind of boxing themselves in in a different way because they're once again putting themselves under a label. They're once again putting themselves in a place where they can become victimized under that label, under that identity. And they're they're perpetuating the thing they were trying to escape to begin with. They may have thought that by changing their identity or their emo, you know, their their title or their name, that they could have changed the circumstances that made them feel so victimized to begin with, but we can't change like, I guess our name and the way we represent ourselves in the world um, and expect change internally because you can only be a victim if you identify as a victim. Right. So like, how do you, how do you step away from that? I really appreciate what Mojo had, um, had, had, mentioned because like he brought up how how parents really do have an effect on on how we see our roles in society and how in a in a very normal way our society is almost uh you know as as these these young people are growing up and becoming adults they are not fitting these roles and so in a rebellious act they are trying to change the norm you know, whether that be, uh, you know, for me, my mom was always the the breadwinner. She was always the the pants in the family. So for me, that was what was modeled for me. Um, she did all the cleaning. She took care of the man, like traditional, traditional. But there was a lot of resentment there because she wanted, she wanted to earn her own keep. She wanted to work a full time, forty hour a week job, which she did, and commuted. She commuted over an hour both ways to her job in LA and she was still expected to upkeep the house, to take care of the child, to pay for all the child things, to show up to all the parent teacher conferences. And what happened is my dad uh, just became like kind of this kind of, I mean, he still worked a job. He was a teacher, but he, he just kind of was like this, this, he didn't, take care of himself he didn't take care of the laundry he didn't take care of the dishes he didn't do anything for himself so resentment built for my mom who was taking on much more responsibility towards my dad she victimized herself because she didn't set a boundary with him saying i expect these things out of you because i'm also taking on a financial burden which normally would be the man's job i am making twice as much as you um I, you need to do you know you need to clean up after yourself it's not even take care of everything. It's just take care of some of the housework. That would really help me. She didn't do because women aren't supposed to ask for that, at least based on old paradigms, right? Old systems in regards to 
the the man's role. And they, you know, their relationship isn't healthy and it's not filled with love. So that this change really is very positive until we all learn how to take accountability as jo, uh, Mojo was, was mentioning, because that's really where our freedom comes from. It's recognizing in moments where we are really still have power in how we react and respond to things. It's not reacting, responding as, as he meant. Self-aware enough to say, oh, I don't like this. Let's walk away from this. Or if someone disrespects you, say, hey, listen, you disrespected me. I don't think it's okay to treat me that way. And that friendship, if they refuse to treat me. Um, same with bosses, as, as Greg had brought up. Right. So I'm really grateful to all 17. 17. Um, as I had stated at the beginning, I am working on a book called Victim to Valiant. And really, it is steps to shift victim mentality. Do that as a society, how we can do that as individuals. Um, working on ourselves and making sure that we're not put in a position where we are. At the at the will of someone else and their actions and their situation. So if you if you want to join me again for another talk where I talk about um about victimization and more about these these skills that I really hope to with others things that helped me overcome my victim mentality as I shared earlier. I have been through a lot of a lot of situations a lot of very uncomfortable bad victimizing situations yet here i am knowing my power knowing that i was responsible for co-creating that scenario and i do not ever blame any one party anymore because i know that i have the power to walk away but at the time that it happened i didn't so my goal is to help everyone women men men you know Adults and children all know how to handle these situations your way and hopefully save their friendships, save their relationship, encourage healthier communication. Thank you guys so much. Please don't forget to follow if you want to tune in for my talks in the in the future. I'm really grateful for the guests that did, you know, jump on, uh, Mojo and Greg, and um, I forgot Sisley, uh, Sisley for coming on and and you know talking about about how much she enjoyed the topic. So thank you guys so much for being brave, stepping up, having your voices be heard, and your for trusting me with. Um, and I, I'm just really grateful that I, I could hold discussions, which would normally come. I mean, they could very easily become triggering situations or triggering discussions. So I thank you guys so much. Um, and I hope to see you guys in my next talk. I uh, hope you guys have a good day. Bye.